if you could start your lecture, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be able to speak in uh, Kaunas, Lithuania. Uh, it would have been nice to be there to share a coffee and a meal with you, but it's very far away and uh, this is the end of the semester and uh, things are very, very busy at the end of the semester. So I'm happy to be able to, to join you uh, virtually. Um, my introduction to architecture comes from my uh, several decade collaboration with Christopher Alexander. I helped him to edit his uh, four volume book, The Nature of Order, which I'm sure everyone um, is using uh, in their courses. And uh, since uh, Alexander got old and stopped working and now he recently died six months ago, uh, for the last 20 years, I have been collaborating with people who work with Alexander, who are interested in Alexander's work, and also with traditional architects who um, are not associated with Alexander, but are very interested in, in the human scale architecture. And there is, uh, of course, a great deal of overlap between Alexandrian architects and um, the traditional and uh, classical architects. So that's the introduction for me, and I have um, published a body of work, books and, and articles, and have given lectures. And uh, almost all of them are publicly available. So uh, if you like what I say, then please look on the internet. And you can find most of what I have said uh, available in open source. Uh, please let me know when you wish for me to start the uh, showing the slides. So actually, can you hear me? So actually, yes, I can when, hear you. You, when you are ready, you can share the slides. Yes, it's up to you. <laughs> OK, here are the slides. This is the title of my talk. This is where you are and the date. So let us begin. Biophilia, our body and mind need contact with complex green ecosystems, and the reason is because we evolved as animals in complex green ecosystems. What that means is uh, when we build our cities, we need uh, accessible medium and small pocket parks in the city. It does not mean uh, a horrible technological city uh, with just one large park in the middle, because then it's not accessible. So this, this distribution of uh, intimate, intimate means you're very close, you can touch it, it's very, uh, you can walk to it. Um, the intimate contact is what really um, makes a biophilic city. So uh, numerous street trees next to buildings, like in old fashioned cities. And um, uh, um, we go further into the actual built form that, um, uh, architects throughout millennia built in order to mimic those properties that come from the trees. So uh, I will uh, uh, clarify this later. The forms themselves and the geometry itself uh, contributes to biophilia if it's done correctly. So uh, we need uh, urban spaces, uh, natural views, uh, urban spaces that allow us to experience uh, space and some greenery and uh, also uh, other human beings. Human beings are alive and they are part of biophilia, a very important part of biophilia. Um, um, secondly, uh, we need uh, to um, try to duplicate and mimic uh, the biophilic effect 
from non-organic material, the structure of the buildings themselves and the the uh, materials and uh, the um, uh, the organized complexity that goes in that direction creates ornamentation. So throughout uh, recorded human history, we have um, produced ornamentation. In fact, let me point out that the recorded human history is much shorter than recorded human ornamentation. The first human things we have are ornaments way before writing that recorded history. So uh, the the source of ornament is the is biophilia, the need for biophilia, the love of life. Let me begin now to describe the components of biophilia. First of all, fractals. Um, if you don't know what a fractal is, uh, you have a complex geometrical structure or object where the smaller components are similar to the larger pieces. This is a perfect fractal. We don't have perfect fractals in architecture, but uh, I will first describe a mathematical fractal. So uh, you take uh, an object and you magnify it and then it should look the same and you keep magnifying it. So you, you focus in and you keep magnifying it uh, and it should look the same. Uh, the, the brain uh, processes these recursive patterns much faster than non-recursive ones. This is called as fractal fluency, and namely you can look at something uh, in less than a second, you can grasp the structural information much, fa much faster if it is a fractal, if it has fractal scaling, much faster than if it doesn't. So there is a, a survival advantage. Everything that is hardwired in the human brain is there because it was a survival advantage. It's not there for, uh, it's not there accidentally. So if we have it there, we need to use it. Otherwise, we feel uh, a stress in, in an unnatural environment. Now, in, in biophilia, uh, we also have other components. We have um, symmetries, multiple symmetries, and those need to cooperate and not uh, fight with fractal scaling. So uh, in, in the fractals, I described um, structure and many different scales, which means different dimensions within each other. And then uh, we also therefore need uh, complex symmetries within those dimensions, and those need to be nested. Nested means the one fits inside the other. Uh, so the, the organized complexity combines fractal scaling with um, symmetries like um, uh, bilateral, rotational, uh, uh, translational symmetry, multiple symmetries fit inside each other and overlap with each other. Here is the fractal human lung. Uh, not well drawn because to draw it well um, would require the thousands of little branches because when you magnify the human lung then you get more and more branches. This is what a fractal is. As far as the symmetry, we have specific neurons in the brain that recognize bilateral symmetry. Then we have even more specified neurons that recognize the specific bilateral symmetries of a face, namely something that uh, is uh, bilaterally symmetric from a vertical axis and then uh, two things on either side for the eyes and then something in the middle that looks like a nose and then something below that looks like a mouth. Very uh, abstract type of face, but there are specific cells that um, that uh, in the human brain that recognize the face. That is because uh, animal evolution and um, created those uh, face-like uh, symmetries and, and animal faces do have some similarity because of, of the eyes and nose and, uh, and mouth. And uh, specifically the cultural uh, evolution, uh, which is the latest um, piece of the evolution on the time scale um, made us uh, engage other humans and that was essential for our evolution uh, and the, the creation of, uh, of, of societal 
uh, structure. Um, the, the ability to interpret animal and human expression can mean death or life for the observer. So uh, now let me list some of the components of the biophilic healing index, which uh, um, I proposed in, in one of my papers. If you want to get a, a numerical estimate of um, how biophilic something is, like a building, uh, a building facade, uh, overall uh, urban place, you just uh, estimate these components and you add them up. So we have the fractals, we have color, uh, we have uh, color should be contrasting, harmonious, intense, uh, curves on all scales. Uh, remember my my discussion of fractals. A curve, a curved building on the large scale does no good. We want curves on many different scales. At the same time, we want uh, the, the entire composition to be harmonious. Otherwise, uh, it is not biophilic. Uh, we want details because the, the eye is attracted to details. We want the representations of nature. This is um, ornament of, of uh, using natural elements or paintings or sculptures or bas reliefs uh, of uh, uh, explicitly natural uh, objects that includes uh, trees, animals, other other people. Um, the architecture of the human race includes these representations of nature for millennia until about uh, 1940 and then it ends. And finally, we have organized complexity with multiple symmetries. This is separate. This is abstract ornamentation for the sake of including multiple symmetries. And this uh, can be seen also throughout millennia of human history. This is the abstract ornamentation we find in Eastern architecture, in, in Islamic architecture, and also in Western architecture, except that in Western architecture, you have a mixture between abstract ornamentation and the representations of nature, whereas in Islamic architecture, the representations are, are in the um, small minority. So here, for example, we have uh, the application of fractals. Is this a fractal? Well, I just want to point out, we have arches of the same shape and you magnify, they are magnified. So you have one, two, three, and then you have the niches uh, in, the, in the pilasters, and they are the same shape as the large arch. So this is very, very modest. Uh, the principle that it hangs together uh, is um, that uh, it has the fractal principles, uh, that you have uh, three or four scales here uh, of the same magnification. Now, uh, if you design without biophilia, you do something very bad for the human body because you reduce the biophilic effect, which is a healing effect. So if you remove color, fractals, curves, the detail, representations of nature and organized complexity, then you limit the biophilic healing index to at most 40%. This is um, minimalist design in buildings. You are limiting to at most 40%. So you, you are already limiting a, a large possibility for a healing, a human healing environment just for stylistic uh, reasons. Uh, now, um, uh, postmodernism also removes the vertical axis while keeping minimalism. If you do that, then you further reduce the healing effect to 30% maximum, but it, in actual practice, it's, 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 it's usually only about uh, 5%. So 30% is the absolute maximum. This is where we get into uh, postmodernism deconstructivism that removes the vertical axis. So there are health implications of architectural styles that are never considered in dominant architectural culture. This is what biophilia reveals. Here I will introduce now one of the patterns, which we, we, I'm going to go into patterns now. Um, do not modernize urban spaces. Uh, this has been a, a tragedy in many cities all around the world that had a, a perfectly working uh, urban space with biophilia and uh, uh, went in and destroyed it. So what is a, a biophilic urbanism? The, the, the good pattern. This is one of the new patterns by Michael Mahaffey and others. 
uh, incorporate biophilic properties and the components into urban structures at all scales, down to the details, including buildings and ornaments. This is a, a absolutely essential condition for um, for uh, an urban space. So um, the good type of urban plaza is a soft urban plaza and it will contain bushes, trees, uh, old fashioned benches. By that I mean not minimalist benches, but old fashioned benches with curves and ornamentation, lamps with detail, curves, ornamentation, human scale graspable street furniture, which means that you can actually um, uh, grasp it. Uh, umbrellas and canopies, uh, kiosks. Uh, these are the components that we see in the most uh, tourist type um, uh, plazas and um, they draw the most uh, users because of biophilia. This is so I'm explaining a touristic and commercial phenomenon of use of urban space because of biophilic design. And why does uh, biophilia attract? Because nature is healing and we have uh, a shelf full of studies in the medical profession showing that health is improved. All the indices are improved. Now, let, let me switch gears uh, in order to uh, go to Alexander's work on uh, patterns and the nature of order. In the nature of order books, um, Alexander gave design tools for achieving coherence. Uh, he uh, listed these as the 15 fundamental properties and those define the geometry of living structure. And uh, they can be checked by uh, directly by visual attention scans, which I will uh, describe in the uh, latter half of this talk. So I will uh, just uh, mention seven of the 15 properties, the first seven, levels of scale, which is Alexander's expression of fractals, which I have all, uh, also uh, also covered. Strong centers, which is focused design, which um, is created through the nested symmetries that I discussed in, in a different language, but it's the same thing. Thick boundaries, which has to do with the fractals, um, because a boundary forms uh, one of the scales of a fractal. Alternating repetition, another type of symmetry, positive space, good shape, local symmetries, which is multiple symmetries. So uh, Alexander uh, proposed these uh, using his own language, but uh, uh, together they, they overlap with uh, some of the uh, some of the other things that I have mentioned. Um, and uh, form uh, are beginning to form a, a unified uh, discipline for uh, for design and interpreting the built environment. So the question to ask, what is the purpose of life? Uh, and one answer is that beauty is the purpose of life. Uh, is that true? Well, uh, this, uh, th this lecture and, and many other uh, publications point to that direction. Uh, it's, it's not an obvious question, but it's something that should um, uh, occupy the thinking of, of anyone uh, in design, uh, planning and architecture. Uh, traditional and vernacular architectures use the same rules during millennia, and those were established into the built forms. Christopher Alexander uh, and his collaborators discovered these uh, rules for uh, adaptive uh, design that gave attachment and belonging, which which has biophilia at, at the uh, at the basis of it. Uh, and uh, uh, this toolbox was uh, formed uh, the the patterns uh, in 1977, and then the nature of order in 2001-2004. Uh, I described the process of Alexander's exploration in this uh, in this essay that if you wish uh, you can uh, look at. Uh, so um, when we examine all this material in depth, uh, the, there is an uh, unmistakable conclusion that if human evolution hardwired us for beauty. And um, a large percentage of that, say 80 percent, has nothing to do with humans. 80 percent is pre-human evolution, animal evolution hardwired us for beauty. And then we uh, humans who think we are so uh, intelligent, smart and special, we just uh, added uh, a few percentage points on top of, of other intelligent animals. So um, 
uh, we recognize and seek visual patterns that are essential for our health, and we do this unconsciously. Uh, it is the mathematical patterns in nature that triggered the evolution of our neural system to profit from them. So the human brain and, and the, um, the, the mechanism, the neural mechanism in the human body and in the animal body that interprets environmental information comes from the mathematical patterns that we uh, find in nature. And those mathematical patterns are the biophilic patterns that, that I listed a few slides ago. Uh, th these uh, the neurological responses instinctively privilege those visual patterns and we seek them everywhere so we can interpret them, whether they are uh, a positive valence for us, good for us or negative valence so we can escape. The Alexandrian patterns codify discovered adaptive solutions. So, for example, I will um, I will focus on, for, for an example, on creating successful urban space, since I mentioned that before. Uh, uh, we want a partial enclosure of a space in a non-threatening and nourishing way. It's going to be an artificial. Uh, some more stories on, uh, on the pattern evolution are on the, this um, essay in the bottom. So, um, Alexander and his colleagues then uh, summarized the patterns which are design relations and they are not patterns uh, of design, uh, of uh, artistic design or architectural design. This is very important to keep in mind. They are socio-geometric patterns. The Alexandrian patterns combine the mathematics and geometry of built structure with uh, social uh, reactions. So it is uh, the link between humans and human reactions to the environment, linking them to a particular geometry. That's what a pattern is, uh, as documented by Alexander. Now, after many years, uh, Michael Mahaffey and co-workers, including myself, um, came up with a collection, 80 new patterns. In this book, A New Pattern Language for Developing Regions. I don't know if you know this book. Uh, it is uh, available to buy. Uh, but uh, Michael uh, very uh, graciously has put it uh, free online. So you, you can find, uh, there are two websites that have all the patterns free online, and these are uh, with the approval of, of Michael Mahaffey, so that um, uh, all students and architects have access to the new patterns. For example, here's a new pattern, the public space system. Lay out every city and every increment of a city as a system of interconnected public spaces, large, medium and small, including streets, squares, parks and the public areas of buildings. Make these spaces walkable and pedestrian friendly with attractive destinations at frequent intervals. Assure that every residence is within 200 meters of an active public space. This pattern contains an enormous amount of useful information stated very concisely that will help to guarantee the use of a of a city through its public spaces. So this is the this is the pedestrian uh, blood system of, of a city. And if this is not uh, created correctly, then the city is not going to be alive. Um, some uh, curious coincidences. Uh, the patent language, which came out, which was published in 1977, anticipated um, two notions later used by writers of biophilia. Those notions are refuge and prospect. Refuge is a psychologically safe space where we feel free from threat, and this is shared uh, by all animals, including um, uh, the, the simplest uh, unicellular animals. Uh, the the uh, the desire to feel free from threat and prospect. Uh, shows uh, shows us, uh, those animals that have an eye, uh, shows us uh, locations at some distance that may uh, attract us and that we look in order to examine this. So um, these um, are, are referred to not by name, but by substance in the, the original pattern in the pattern language, hierarchy of open space, satisfy the feeling of having one's back protected by a solid structure, which is refuge, 
well, being able to see out of the world, which is prospect. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm restating the original patterns in my own language to, uh, to make these uh, connections with the words that were not originally used. Now, a wayfinding, which means just uh, walking around or even or moving, driving around, uh, depends upon neurological feedback. We are guided by visceral feelings uh, reacting to hormones. And we decide whether the environment is safe or not. Uh, and our perceptual system is the only dependable judge of whether being in a spot is good for us or not. Here are two of the old patterns of the original patterns uh, that link emotionally usable public space to paths. We have the, the, uh, the first one. Composer path is a sequence of intermediate destinations. Flow is governed by the body's instinctive movements and psychological reactions. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, at the audience here and nobody's reacting. Come on, uh, <laughs> my distinguished hosts, this just, this pattern 120 just undid the way that architects and planners design paths. So I expected a more uh, shocking reaction. OK, what does it say? It says you cannot just uh, uh, sit on the computer and draw a line and say people will walk uh, along this line. No, the people will refuse to walk along this line. They will feel uh, threatened. Uh, you have to have a sequence of intermediate destinations. You have to pay. You have to pay attention to how the user walking along every point of this path will feel uh, if, if there are intermediate destinations, uh, because uh, it's the body's instinctive movements and psychological reactions that determine whether you walk in a direction or not. And, and secondly, and even more in a revolutionary manner, a successful path is a welcoming space for people to linger in if they're not in a hurry. So people should not be in a hurry. You should be able to stay and stand for a while in, in a position of the path. If you can do that without feeling stressed, then that path is successful. And someone who is in a hurry will walk fast along that path and that's perfectly fine. So these are traditional spaces that are shaped by human movement and that have all the characteristics that uh, that I, um, I outlined previously with the patterns and the patterns are there. OK, you cannot get the patterns from. By looking at these things, it's a lot of work. It's very hard work to get the patterns. Fortunately, that work has been done for everybody. And those are documented. So for uh, urban space, we have uh, effective and tested rules for creating attractive urban space. We have a giant outdoor room open to the sky. It is surrounded by welcoming facades and it is highly permeable to pedestrian flows. And here is a paper with Pietro Pagliardini that uh, lists some uh, conditions for designing urban spaces. Uh, a more recent paper here, 2021, uh, lists the rules for urban space uh, through design patterns. Uh, and anyone who's interested in urban spaces uh, can um, uh, look at that. This is form shaped according to human feeling and not on the computer screen. By how something looks like on a plan that is uh, the least important. What is important is uh, how the human body feels when uh, placed right there. And in order to do this effectively, you need to do it on the site and you need to do it with full scale mock ups with cheap materials. It's the only way that you can um, uh, anticipate and, and adjust for the human feeling. Uh, two more patterns for urban squares. Uh, put public squares a maximum width of approximately uh, 20 meters. Uh, and the length can vary. Uh, the walls should make people feel that uh, they're in a large open public room. So this is the uh, key for success. This is an original pattern and here's a new pattern. Uh, that uh, is complementary to the old one. Uh, create a neighborhood squares adjacent to neighborhood through streets and at nodes where commercial activities are present or likely. 
So these are uh, the um, neighborhood square is adjacent and, and uh, does not allow the through street to go through the square because that destroys the square. It, it, it just becomes then a, a car thoroughfare and is no longer a square useful for pedestrians. So uh, coming back to the to the basic principle of design that um, we we should design according to the way our body has evolved. Uh, and the body uh, requires uh, certain geometrical conditions in order to feel comfortable. It should be embraced by the public space. Um, the, the public space should define a concave perimeter boundary so that you feel that the space is convex, the actual space is convex. And now uh, we'll get into uh, VAS, visual attention scans. So this is from a paper with uh, 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 Boras, Brilman and Taylor. This is a contemporary uh, urban space that is a total failure. Why is it a total failure? Because we take the visual attention scan and we see that the, there are three points of focus. The parking sign, another traffic sign on the left, and a reflection on this very dreary canal with water. But uh, the, the eye does not focus either on the pavement or on the facades of the surrounding buildings, left or right. Therefore, this is a total failure. You have this huge public space and there is absolutely no um, interest, informational interest of the human being, either on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the floor which is supposed to attract us to walk, uh, or on the uh, on the facades that uh, we have to walk uh, alongside. So this the, the uh, VAS scans uh, show that uh, this is a, a total failure, which brings us to neuroscience because uh, the VAS uh, actually models neuroscience. Well, uh, when we are um, experiencing the environment, we have a, a short um, time period perception cycles and they keep going on and on and on. It's, it's a, uh, uh, these cycles um, influence our decisions these, um, in order to, for the body to make automatic and unconscious decisions on where we go and how fast we go and in which direction we go. And this is the paper uh, from which the previous um, slide was taken on the bottom. Now, why does this matter? It matters for human health. Because if you don't, if your body doesn't want to go in the particular direction that you need to go in order to transact some business, then you're forcing your body. If you force your body, you subject it to stress. If the body is subjected to stress, it becomes sick. That's why we have a sick society, a sick industrial society. I mentioned the VAS, visual attention scans. Those are the easiest of the new diagnostic tools that we have for design. Uh, you just take a photograph uh, and um, uh, scan it, uh, the software scans the photograph and gives you uh, a simulation of where the eye is going to go. However, we have at least 10 other uh, convenient and portable methods. You can use actual eye tracking real time uh, because today the eye tracking apparatus is just like a, a, a pair of sunglasses that you wear and you can walk around and, uh, and um, your, uh, your eye motions and fixations are recorded and then you can uh, look at this again. Or uh, you can uh, do this in the uh, uh, in a lab. You just uh, show uh, uh, either a still or a movie of, um, of a scene and you're wearing the eye tracking glasses and uh, they record your uh, eye fixations on the computer screen as as you uh, virtually walk through a particular scenery. So this tells you, uh, this tells you, and, and we have found out that what we look for is um, uh, 
information that will help us to navigate the, the particular design. So can we identify the entrance? Yes or no? If we have to go to a building and we cannot identify the entrance, then uh, that creates stress. It's a, it's, the design is a failure. Uh, at the same time, we have other uh, wearable indices that um, show the, the body mood, and this is very important because uh, this is totally separate from the eye tracking. The eye tracking show attention, which, which is attention to what may be positive or what may be negative. It's attention. At the same time, uh, uh, we can wear uh, portable sensors that tell you uh, the stress levels, the actual stress levels of the body. And that gives you the emotional experience of space. So this is revolutionary uh, stuff that, that um, is, is so far totally ignored by architectural education and by architectural practice. This will um, uh, totally revolution, revolutionize the way buildings are built from, from uh, now on. Now, for example, getting back to the simplest VAS uh, tracking, this is a fairly uh, uh, old fashioned building with windows regularly uh, positioned. And we see that the eye looking at this, this is a simulation, but the eye looking at this um, looks at the most of the facade, looks at all of the facade uniformly. There's a uniform blue glow and uh, looks at the top windows a little bit more intensely. This is perfectly fine. Uh, I, I drew this and I intentionally did not draw an entrance because I wanted to, to show how the, the eye spreads uniformly throughout, uh, throughout the, the building facade. So this is an explanation of, of the previous uh, slide. Um, however, we have design ideology that permeates design today and for the last uh, uh, 100 years. And uh, that ideology uh, proposes a minimalist and uh, recently and deconstructivist design rules and those undo visceral human connection. And I will try to, to uh, uh, prove that. Um, some more urban spaces. Uh, so here is a minimalist building, which is just an empty rectangle. You see, the eye refuses to look inside the building. And I'm talking about the unconscious engagement, which, which is uh, uh, shown in the first three seconds. After that, you force yourself to look at it because you have to walk by it or towards it. You see, the eye looks only at the corners, but that's useful. Uh, that's useless. This, I, this building does not exist. And if you have to walk next to it, and it's a, a very large building, it's just an alien presence that causes terrible stress. So now we finally have a predictable and testable basis for uh, design. And um, we are able to uh, identify uh, accepted design tools uh, um, since the beginning of the 20th century and uh, discredit them. And uh, we have a new generation of architectural historians that take the accepted design um, theories from the 1920s and show that uh, it goes back to un untestable dogma. So that is not my business, but uh, um, that work is being published. So what is the uh, what is the solution? Well, uh, the solution cannot occur uh, cannot occur before people realize what is really going on. The difference between engaging and disengaging environments. Uh, when people um, realize what is going on and that this is that this is harming public health in a major way, something that's totally unexpected until today. Uh, then there is a movement in order to transform the geometries that make people anxious and uh, implement geometries that make us, that keep us mentally and physically healthy. Uh, see what happens when we add ornamentation to a building to uh, to define its, uh, its uh, boundary and, and the entrance. The eye is immediately attracted there. This, this could be a mathematical proof of the value of ornament. We connect viscerally to the building through the ornament.
So again, to continue on this um, contrast between accepted design and what we need to get rid of, uh, concrete boxes are inhuman. And most common people will agree with that. Uh, be, uh, but now we know the reason why. The, the, the exterior facade of minimalist uh, uh, buildings does not engage the human neural system. So what do we do? Well, we, we cannot tear down all cities built after the Second World War, but we can transform the ground floors. Go and add ornament. Uh, if there is a sheer wall without doors and windows, punch openings into sheer solid facades. Is it worth to spend the money? Well, uh, do we want a healthy society? How much um, money does um, does a, a a city or a nation pay for for treating alienation and depression that is due to architecture? Okay, as we speak, these are new results, and and uh, societies have not realized how much. Uh, illness is due just to the geometry of the architecture. So what is the point of a building? Um, a big money interest are uh, used to build uh, to build buildings that uh, we don't see. And this is another uh, a paper here on the bottom with uh, Alexander Slavdas and Anne Sussman. These are photos by Alexander Slavdas that um, he found two separate cases of an older building right in front of a um, curtain wall glass skyscraper in the back. And then when we do the eye tracking, you see the eye refuses to see the giant building behind. For, for, the, for, the, uh, for the human brain, only the traditional building exists. Let me summarize um, some of what I have uh, have learned, um, what I have shown here for uh, these facades that surround urban space to engage the user in a positive manner. So uh, we need to use scaling symmetry with nested visual patterns. Scaling symmetry implies fractals that you scale up and down and you have uh, some symmetries uh, with nested different types of symmetries together on many different scales. Uh, those those will superimpose reflectional, translational, or rotational symmetries when appropriate. You don't have to have all of them, but you need to have many of them. Uh, that's the whole point. Emphasize the vertical symmetry axis because of gravity. The, the human brain seeks the vertical symmetry axis. A diagonal is disturbing. Uh, when we look at traditional architecture, diagonals are always balanced by an opposite and equal diagonal so that you actually have a vertical symmetry axis that is implicit. The, the uh, unbalanced diagonal creates anxiety and stress. I know that many Prisca prizes have been awarded to architects who create an unbalanced diagonal axis. I'm not responsible for that. Uh, this is society's lack of understanding and uh, ignorance of medical data. Uh, colors, avoid colors reminiscent of death uh, and um, pathologies. These are uh, dark brown, gray, the, the preferred colors of, of uh, contemporary architecture and go back to the old colors, bright, pastels, uh, contrasting, harmonizing colors of, of uh, thousands of years of a human building and then employ order details which uh, uh, include ornament but also include just just plain uh, tectonic details uh, get away from minimalism and get away from randomness um, one other uh, um, consequence of this is framing uh, try to put frames in order to emphasize a particular tectonic element uh, and those combined with the human scale detail. Uh, and the human scale is one meter, uh, anywhere from one centimeter up to two meters. Those are the, this is the range of the human body, the scales. If you have such well-defined scales within uh, a coherent composition, then uh, the human body instinctively connects in a positive way. 
to uh, to that uh, composition or construction. Here are two examples. On the left, we have a uh, border that surrounds a complex interior, in this case, the door. On the right, we have a border surrounding an empty interior, which is an open, uh, an open passage. Well, the complexity then is contained in the border itself. And I will conclude with uh, the most striking uh, part of all the effects of the children. Children cannot connect to life uh, if uh, um, uh, they cannot use their neurology to um, navigate the environment. And um, they will not grow up correctly. The, uh, their emotion uh, is stunted by uh, growing up in a human environment. And therefore, when this happens, uh, children, our children are sacrificed to design ideology, allied to megalomania, money and power. Michael Mahaffey and I have coined the term symmetry deficit disorder, where a child's built environment does, does not have uh, sufficient symmetry. And the big question here is, does symmetry deficit disorder lower a child's intelligence? There are indications that yes. Uh, there are classic experiments dating back from the 1980s right through today uh, in animals, fish and mice, when the, the, uh, the young are raised in a minimalist environment, then uh, the brain is smaller and it is insufficiently wired. And uh, these are the two publications already from 2012 uh, uh, published in Metropolis, which is a widely read architectural magazine. Uh, it made no difference at all because the world is simply um, uh, refuses to see what happens. Why is this so? Uh, I mean, why am I getting so excited about this? Well, the infant brain develops 75% of its mass after birth, and the the mechanism where the brain develops this mass is because of sensory input from the complexity. Uh, if the child does not have sufficient visual, informational, and uh, other types of visual, auditory, complexity um, in, the, in the environment, then the brain will not develop. Simply put, there will be a lower IQ. We have a horrible and tragic finding now. The, uh, the, the two experiments that were just published that measured an IQ deficit for built children born during COVID-19. And the question is, is this due to reduced environmental simulation? Well, nobody knows. We need more experiments, but this is a huge drop in IQ, which is a, uh, a sort of a, um, a, um, a, a vast change uh, in, in the measure development, and I have uh, published three pap uh, papers on this, uh, two scientific articles and one popular article that um, uh, raises uh, uh, concern. So uh, to conclude, for the future, uh, biophilia and patterns determine human architecture. Neuroscience informs architecture. Design has to adapt to body signals, human emotions, and spatial perceptions. We have tested form languages and pattern languages that we should be using. Uh, those reuse successful solutions that were discovered in traditional buildings and spaces. And this is my talk. Thank you very much. There was some applause, but I was not so fast enough to turn the microphone on for me. <laughs> Thank you a lot. It was really, really interesting. Maybe we can ask some questions. Would you answer them? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, that's why I went quickly to leave time for questions and discussion. OK, so maybe we have some questions. Okay, maybe you could come up closer here because we have one. Thank you so much for such an interesting lecture. And uh, I would start with, uh, I have many questions actually, but I will start with two. 
Uh, one of these uh, recently, I'm a historian of architecture. Yes, recently excuse I'm me, excuse me, excuse me. I cannot see you. Can you please? Uh, either yes. Now I see you. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. The other way. The other way. Yeah, that way. Okay, that's better. Thank oh, you. I'm moving faster <laughs> than camera. Uh, so I'm researching Lithuanian diaspora after World War II in the United States and Canada. And actually what they did, they created uh, so-called Lithuanian national architecture, which is full of symbolism. So my question is, uh, can we apply uh, this methodology for evaluation of uh, if we were successful for specific purpose of healing uh, uh, war trauma and healing nostalgia uh, with uh, tools of architecture? Is it uh, like, is it possible to use this as a methodology? Yes, I think you can find useful uh, hints at uh, what I covered in my lecture. And of course, uh, my lecture points to publications. So please go and, and see those publications. And uh, I suspect that you will find some useful tools. Because um, my concern is, is not specific to Lithuania. My concern is specific to human health. And in order to uh, implement human health, you implement fractals and symmetry as well. If you can use specific uh, symbols from um, ornamental and um, ornamental symbols and cultural symbols, that you create a form language that has, uh, in addition to architectural meaning and, and that contributes to healing, it also has um, historical meaning. So you are, as we say in English, you're killing two birds with one stone. You have the advantage of two different things. And in fact, all, all cultures, uh, uh, ancient Chinese culture uses symbols that contribute to human health in the, arch in the classic architecture. Yet those symbols have religious meaning as well. Second example, look at Islamic architecture. It, it has, uh, the, the classic Islamic architecture has wonderful healing properties because it satisfies all the mathematical rules that I have talked about. And we have some um, stylized uh, Kufic writing in Arabic from quotations from, from the Quran on the buildings. Now, we Westerners don't understand this. There's no, it, it is simply very beautiful and contributes to a healing effect. And we stand next to the building. It's a gorgeous building. It, it heals us. But for somebody who can read the text, it has, in addition, a religious meaning. Am I explaining myself? So you can use a, a double, a double sword, okay, double-edged sword. You can use a, a form language uh, that will create a healing environment just from the mathematics. And at the same time, the um, the specific symbols have cultural meaning and historical meaning to those who appreciate them. Thank you. And if I may, one more question, if just not, <laughs> don't want to be. Uh, well, I, I, just... I, I want this. Yeah, I want the, uh, the students to ask questions. So students, please get ready after this gentleman. Yes, yes, I'm really sorry, but one more uh, specific question about, you talk a lot of about forms, but what about patina? If uh, look uh, from neurological, uh, neuroscience perspective, can you say that uh, uh, in a historical building, the patina, the knowledge of the importance of, uh, of the building, can it also contribute to the issue of uh, uh, healing? Yes, yes, you're quite right. I did not have time to, to mention this, but the, the surface is very important. And uh, we, uh, part of biophilia goes down to the smallest details, which is the microstructure. So we can get close, as close as possible and touch the surface of a building. If it is wood or, or stone or polished stone and we see the, the microstructure that is also contributing to biophilia or an older building that has the weathering and it, it makes it nicer. Um, say if we have if we have a, a natural material or if we have color and the color weathers and it makes it nicer. Uh, that does not happen though with with raw concrete. 
the preferred material of, of uh, 20th century architecture, which is raw, brutalist concrete, is just unfriendly. And when it weathers, it becomes stained and even uglier. So this is a, a specific example of a positive versus a negative uh, surface patina. OK, other questions? Uh, thank you. Maybe I can ask you stop sharing your screen because maybe because of that, maybe you will see us better. Right now, I think you see just half of us. Can you see us better right now? Yeah. Like by the view. OK, so that is the technical issue. Maybe we have some questions from the student side. Not yet. I want to ask one question because you mentioned, you know, uh, the importance of nature in healing. Yes, so all the idea of the aphilic design, but also symmetry. How those two can be combined together because symmetry seems to be important, but in the nature you have like fractals, yes, but they are not really very strictly symmetrical. How you could um, explain those two important aspects? Yes, I think you are under a misconception. Nature includes plants and animals. Plants are fractals and they have some symmetries, OK? Usually rotational and helical symmetries. But animals are bilaterally symmetrical because they have to walk under gravity. And for us humans, animals are just as important as plants. So 50% 50, 50 and 50%, that's where we get the symmetries. And the faces, when an animal comes by and looks at us, we have to decide, is this a friendly animal or an unfriendly animal that's going to eat us? That's bilateral symmetry. To interpret the face, is, it means life or death for our ancestors. So we have to interpret that symmetry. Does that answer your question? Okay, that makes sense, yes. <laughs> thank you. Maybe we have other questions. We also have students online. And yes, uh, Marius, please. Thank you for uh, accepting this invitation. It's nice. You were a big inspiration for me and for my research. Uh, nowadays, there is a huge leap with the tools of artificial intelligence. How do you think uh, they could be used or to uh, maybe help or, or generate your feeling architecture? Um, I am very optimistic that artificial intelligence can provide a huge tool to help in um, adaptive and biophilic architecture. And I'm working with my group of researchers to write papers. So far, we have written two papers on artificial intelligence. Uh, one is published and uh, you, you can look it up by, by Google. Uh, um, the one that is published is, is a lengthy technical article saying uh, why um, the metaverse failed to gather users. And the reason is because uh, the, the reason we put forward in this paper is that it did not use biophilia. It, it imported uh, the uh, stale notions of minimalist design from buildings architecture that go back to the 1920s. And we conjecture that this was the failure of Meta. So our proposal is to use the techniques that uh, I outline in this paper in order to design the metaverse if the big tech companies want to make billions and billions of dollars like they want to. So this uh, this is outside of architecture. This is uh, uh, this is commerce. Let the uh, tech companies uh, read our article, which just appeared two weeks ago. Let them read our article and decide for themselves. Do they want to support stale design ideologies and lose billions of dollars, or do they want to make billions of dollars by adopting our our solutions, patterns and fractals and biophilia, you know, it's their decision. We have just offered the explanation. And, uh, and another article that will appear uh, the 1st of May in, in, in one week uh, uses uh, chat GPT to identify uh, inhuman architecture. So the, uh, the, this is in a popular uh, journal, 
which you know you, you can find after uh, the, the first of May, or I can send you the link because the, the, the proofs are already online. So I used ChatGPT and I asked it, please give me the characteristics of inhuman architecture. And ChatGPT described your standard buildings being built today. So to me, I said, this is proof that what is being built is inhuman. ChatGPT described everything perfectly. So we are building inhuman buildings. And uh, I'm using AI, not, to not in this case to design a new building, but to prove that what we're building is inhuman because ordinary common people keep complaining. I hate this building, it's inhuman. But the architect said, no, 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 no. this is a wonderful, you know, even won a prize. You're stupid, you, you're, you're ignorant, you don't know what you're talking about. We know better. Well, chat GPT shows that the, the common reaction of the people is correct. Any other details you want to ask? Uh, I'll be happy to tell you. No, for, for now, thank you. Do we have more questions from online? And from here? Yeah, it's preferred to, to make minimalistic building. <laughs> My question is why architects still prefer, you know, to design minimalistic buildings? <laughs> there is inertia. You have a profession that has made a lot of money for a hundred years. All the architecture schools have been building the minimalistic buildings are very good. Uh, there is a shelf full of architectural theory explaining why minimalistic buildings are good. All of that theory is total nonsense. But there is an inertia. OK, the system continues and uh, clients are convinced to uh, pay for a minimalistic building. So as long as the client will pay for a minimalistic building, architects will continue to produce it. It's going to take a revolution to change it. And um, uh, because Architecture is not an intellectual discipline. Architecture is a practical commercial discipline. It depends upon what the client will pay to build. So, so far clients have, have not learned about all the results that we, we are discussing, even though they have been uh, published. We are publishing these results uh, for the last uh, several years, but it, it does not reach the, the, uh, the common public and so far, even if a client um, uh, reads something somewhere about these these uh, new findings, uh, uh, an architect will uh, just uh, bully them and tell them, no, 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 all this is wrong. Look, uh, look at the architecture magazines. This is what's beautiful today. You have to build your building like this. And, and they bully the client and uh, the client then pays for a horrible a minimalistic building. I, I want more questions. Listen, you know, this is a great inconvenience for me to get up early in the morning to make this lecture, to give an opportunity for questions. OK, this is your chance. I'm not coming to Kaunas in person anytime soon. So either you take your chance or, you know, or you lose it. Uh, can I ask a question? You can as many as you want. <laughs> uh, so I'm an architect um, and also a student, a uh, master's student. Uh, so uh, about the minimalist architecture, in fact, sometimes uh, I think it's the uh, builders that remove the details. If you design a building uh, where you can, uh, where details can be removed, builders uh, most definitely will remove them. Yeah, so it's for my for my experience, and also I want to ask. So, are you saying that uh, beauty can be defined? Oh yes, beauty is okay. definitely defined. Yeah, okay. but but look, look, uh, uh, birute. Birute, yeah. Yeah, um, beauty. There are several types of beauty. There is uh, what I'm concerned with is objective beauty. 
which is beauty that relates to human biology. And that can be defined because we, we know uh, we can discuss the medical uh, conditions, the neurological connections, and we have all the different factors and we can put them together and define beauty that is objective beauty that we respond to neurologically and unconsciously. That's one kind of beauty, but there is also subjective beauty. You go to architecture school and your teachers tell you this ugly building is beautiful and you learn something because of an intellectual conviction. Somebody convinces you that this is beautiful. So uh, this could be totally opposite to what your body is telling you. And, and uh, uh, most architects are schizophrenic because they hold these two opposite types of beauty in their brain. What one is type of beauty their body is telling the other type of beauty they have learned from authority and you know the human being trusts authority. You learn from authority and you look at the media and uh, these horribly ugly buildings are praised and the best prizes go to those uh, and, and the architects of these horrible sadistic buildings make millions and millions of dollars and they become famous and they drive a Ferrari. Okay, and you're driving a second hand uh, you know, junk of Volkswagen. So the, uh, this is contradictory. And uh, but, but you know, I, I'm not. Discounting the beauty that is learned because it's very powerful. It's, to somebody who has learned it is very powerful, but it's separate from from objective beauty. OK, thank you. Oh, and by the way, yeah, uh, Birute, uh, all my friends have, have terrible problems with the construction uh, companies because they design a beautiful building and then the, the constructors, they just forget, you know, it's yes, in the blueprints yes. and they ignore it. They don't put the, the, the ornament and then they have a fight with, you know, the, the architect has a fight and says, oh, you know, we can't do it, it's too expensive. And they say, well, you know. Yes. It costs it just a thousand dollars more for the whole building, you know, and it's in the blueprints. Uh, we don't know how to do it. Well, I'll show you how to do it. Yeah, every that's step what we is, deal with. is a fight. Every step is a fight. Uh, and the reason is what I said earlier it's, it's the inertia continuity. Okay, the construction companies have not had to create inexpensive good ornament for a century, so they don't know how to, they don't want to learn, they don't want to bother because they have been building without ornament. So, you know, why bother? It's it's just inertia. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know that it's uh, the same in other countries too, not not just here in Lithuania. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I'm friends with with the greatest uh, uh, classical architect, Leon Krier. Mm -hmm. Whenever I talk to him, he's uh, he's pulling his hair. He, you know, he says in this <laughs> building, I constantly fight because they, they, they left out this and they messed this up and I, I was, you know, I was there trying to supervise and they still got it wrong and mm -hmm. they just don't, don't want to do that. It's not that they're sabotaging. They just don't want to bother with with the uh, additional uh, um, uh, components that, uh, that the architect is demanding. OK, so I wanted to ask um, which architectural styles would you consider beautiful? And maybe you could tell us um, which architects would you consider uh, for us to look up to? It's a bad question. I would consider I would. No, 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 but listen, this is very important. I, I, I would consider you thinking about what I have said. And seeing that the question you ask comes from dominant architectural culture, which. Goes according to styles and names, that's what has destroyed architectural culture. So if you were my student, I would tell you forget about names especially the famous names. Forget about styles. Go with your body. What does your body tell you? Walk around Kaunas. I've never been to Kaunas. I'm sure there are some older buildings. Do you get a feeling of, of um, good health just by standing next to the building, approaching the building, passing by next to the building? 
It could be a building that's, you know, an apartment block that's built in the 1920s. I don't know, you know, I'm making this up. We don't know the architect, not a famous architect. But there, from that building, you can learn architecture. And it has nothing to do with style, it has nothing to do with the name of the architect. As soon as you focus on names and styles and architects, then immediately you're drawn, you know, the moth, the moth comes to the, you know, the butter, the night butterfly, the moth comes to the lamp and is drawn to the light. So architects and students are drawn to famous names, but those famous names are mostly bad architects and they're psychopaths because they create buildings that make people sick, okay? I, I'm not exaggerating. If you create something very large that makes people sick, it's a crime. And why do they do it? Because they <laughs> they do it for their ego and for money, but it's a, it's a toxic product. So I, I don't want to insult you, but I'm, I'm just, um, I want to point out the danger of the question that your question comes from the dominant architectural culture, which is uh, uh, has a negative focus on names and styles. So all styles are good if they have produced healing architecture. All around the world, there are 5,000 styles. And maybe three or four styles in the 20th century produce bad architecture because it makes you feel sick. So all those thousands of good styles are good. Uh, if I may give one more question, I uh, really like your approach uh, and uh, uh, just to to uh, place everything in the right place. So, can you say your opinion on uh, Bauhaus uh, school in the South? Can you? Yeah. Well, look, look, uh, th this is beyond my talk. The Bauhaus did a tremendous harm to architecture because it introduced inhuman architecture. Uh, the, the Bauhaus uh, promised to be a um, a school for the future, uh, based on new principles, uh, but it was very destructive because Walter Gropius himself said, "We are going to destroy all of traditional architecture. We're going to start from zero." It's an extremely dangerous statement and he implemented it. Why is it dangerous? Because you kill patterns, because patterns go back to thousands of years of human building. So if you kill patterns, if you kill all tradition, you kill the patterns and you cannot use the patterns. And that's what I have been talking about. If you kill tradition, it contains biophilic design, you kill biophilia. So if you kill biophilia and you kill patterns, you cannot, by definition, create a healing environment. So the only good thing that uh, Gropius um, uh, and the Bauhaus introduced was uh, light because they used more uh, uh, larger glass expanses. So light is good because it uh, a natural sunlight has um, antiseptic properties. So it opened up some some spaces of uh, 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 you know pre 19th century that, w that did not have enough natural light, and there was uh, uh, surfaces that um, uh, allowed for microbes to to grow. So um, I think the, the only positive contribution of, of the um, Bauhaus was uh, to allow more natural light, but that was taken to extremes because now we have a curtain wall skyscrapers that are just a it's a horrible experience. It's glare. Too much light is, is horrible. It's just as bad as is not enough light. So the, the glare is, is very bad for the eyes. And so this is a problem that was originally stated in the Bauhaus, you know, Dessau, <laughs> 1910. The glare. So now the construction industry is spending billions 
to create very expensive rare metal films for the glass skyscrapers in order to cut down the glare. Well, that is, that is an easier solution. Look, people, just build a solid wall. You know, you don't have to use these rare, uh, it is a, a, a perversion because the idea is stuck in the mind. The idea that we have to have a glass building the curtain wall of, of Gropius and Mies, actually. Uh, so uh, we spend enormous amounts of money to make these films to keep the glass box. Why? This is, has become a religious symbol, the glass box. Just put some panels, okay? Build a semi-solid wall uh, according to the climate. You know, a southern exposure in a desert climate. You have all the sun coming in. So you have to run the air conditioning all day. What does that do? It uses uh, it uses up uh, petroleum. Where do you get the petroleum to run the air conditioning for a stupid, stupid, stupid architectural typology? Where do you get the petroleum? Well, if you have an oil well, you know, nearby, you get the petroleum. Some countries do not. So if you are a powerful country, you go and invade Nigeria and you steal the oil. OK, and you have your army there to protect the oil companies that are pumping the oil. And occasionally you give a suitcase of uh, cash to the local politicians. And everything is fine. I mean, I mean, archit bad design and architecture has global consequences that, you know, are, are will lead us to the brink of, of nuclear war. Do you want to ask anything else? <laughs> no. Maybe we have some more questions from online. Uh, which city do you think? Uh, sorry. A second, I will check. We have a question in the chat. So, which city do you think are the most geophilic right now? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to use microphone. So, there is a question from Anastasia. Which city do you think uh, or cities are the most geophilic right now? Well, uh, it, it's not a question that can be answered, but portions of cities. The self-built settlements, the favelas and the villas miserias, the slums of the world are the most biophilic because they use the least amount of energy. And the, uh, the uh, buildings themselves are built by the residents using scrap material, and those residents know nothing about architecture, so they can uh, use, uh, make nice spaces and they can use color if they find color. So the the dimensions are good. Uh, if those residents can ornament, they do ornament. Um, that's not what one usually considers as a city because the living conditions are horrible. However, as far as biophilia, zero energy use. Good urban uh, uh, dimensions, everything else is horrible. But as far as city, uh, that's where you find uh, the uh, the city because it is unaffected by architecture. So I will even go further. So occasionally the government of Brazil or India or, or Indonesia uh, says, well, we're going to put money and we will help these people. And they go in and they bulldoze this urban fabric and they build horrible concrete prison blocks. And they say, we have helped the people, but they have destroyed the lives of these people because what they replace the slums with is horrible, horrible, non-biophilic uh, boxes that, that put these people in prison. And they uh, the this imposed uh, technocratic architecture totally destroys the social fabric because it is impossible to continue the human relations that existed um, among the, the, the community before the imposition. But usually uh, these interventions uh, are um, um, an example of corruption because um, some builder makes money, the government pays to, to build these uh, horrible blocks and 
uh, somebody makes money, but they, they don't care about the uh, the actual residents. It's just an excuse. Okay, thank you for your answer. And uh, um, I'm thinking that you know architecture schools pr probably are in a tricky position, you know, because uh, the things that you are mentioning that we need to look uh, at the human needs, that's true, yes, but we also at the architecture schools, we always encourage people to think creatively and to create something new. And uh, as you mentioned with the Bauhaus, yes, they also had that idea that we have to start from zero, you know, and that creativity and that you are mentioning that like Pritzky prizes, they are all for the terrible buildings but uh, those buildings are somehow unique or different, you know, but people probably feel better in that environment, which is not so unique or different, but just basically the environment which suits the human needs, yes? So how you could comment what, what should be the road for the architecture schools and architecture educators as well, where to look at? <laughs> Yes, I, I have nothing to add to what I just said. Um, architecture has uh, developed a, um, a split personality because buildings for human use have to look old fashioned. Why? Because if you put patterns and if you put biophilia, it reminds you of something in the past because the spaces are the same dimension, it could be totally new, okay? You design a building according to biophilia and patterns today, and you look through the web, it's completely original. There's nothing like this that has been built in, in, in 3,000 years. However, it feels old fashioned because the spaces are human scale. So this is where the architecture establishment and, and the architecture professors say this is not innovative enough because it doesn't feel innovative. So what does it mean to feel innovative? It means that you feel anxious. The real architectural innovation is when the person feels anxious. That's bad for the health. So innovation is tied to anxiety, which is bad for the health. It is up to society to decide what it wants. Do we want to encourage innovation that creates anxiety? That has been the, the, the aim of architecture schools. And the students love this, especially male students. OK, I'm going to be a sexist here. Uh, you know, traditionally males are attracted to, uh, to warlike and aggression more than women. You know, women have the motherly uh, instinct. Uh, in fact, Christopher Alexander, told me that his best students were women because they had more sensitivity to human qualities than the men. You know, the, the men were would go off and do something strange and he would have to tell them, you know, no, no, this is bad. Uh, please come back. But, you know, but the women had a better sense of, of human scale design. So so coming back to to architects assaults for the last uh, 30 or 40 years, you know, it's the men who want to do something really outstanding and they don't mind uh, making the user feel uh, totally uh, de destroyed by imposing the will, you know, something grandiose, something uh, powerful. Okay, thank you, Marus, you want to add something? Yeah. I, I want to continue this discussion. What about copyright? When you design something that looks old, maybe it looks like something that was seen before, and then you are in the risk of uh, copyright infringement. Maybe this copyright law is altogether bad like, because it introduces this conception of yeah, um, of a must to be unique. I have to be unique to avoid this copyright infringement. Yes, uh, Marius, I cannot answer the question because I know nothing about uh, architectural copyright law. However, the type of building that uh, uh, that are good for humanity, that are good for the user, they may have elements that copy historical buildings, but there's no copyright problem because if, if you have a, a door that looks like 
19th century door. There's no copyright problem. I think the copyright problem will arise only if you copy a Prisker Prize winning building and make it exactly the same. Then the architect who is alive will sue you and say you have copied my building. But you know, you don't. <laughs> Though I've talked for an hour saying you don't want to copy such a building, you want to copy a more modest human scale building. And if it's older, you know, it's too old. It does not uh, cover copyright. Then to come back to previous conversation about the, how construction workers ruin good, good projects. Could be possible using modern technologies like computer controlled machines or 3D printers to design architecture in where biophilic elements would be embedded in construction and could not work otherwise if they not made like that. Thank you, Marius. This is a very, very good comment. And my friends are beginning to use the latest uh, technology to create ornament because it is cheap. OK, not good quality, but very inexpensive because we have the, the printing, 3D printing. Our technology can produce ornament that used to be extremely expensive. We can produce the most gorgeous ornament very inexpensively and embedded in the, uh, in the actual construction. So these are pioneering techniques occurring just now. There are people in the United States and in Europe who do only ornament using the latest 3D printing techniques. So my friends who are the architects are working closely with the uh, ornamenters in order to, to use this, uh, which is totally different from, uh, say, 50 years ago when you had to shape the ornament by hand and it was really very expensive. Now all, it's extremely cheap to get a, a wonderful result. So the, the, the horizon is open of using the latest technology to, to create biophilic uh, quality and response in buildings. And we, we have not, we are only seeing the beginning now. And what do you think about uh, origami architecture? The facades that change over time, do they, they, they really, maybe they could look like old buildings, but they really are dynamic and, and adapt to environment. They potentially could create a pleasant environment in terms of temperature, lightning and so on. But uh, in terms of how they look, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, Marius, I, I know nothing about um, buildings that change their shape over over time. I mean, all, all that I know is very old fashioned. You have an awning and uh, that comes down to protect in the afternoon against the sun. So that, that is a change, but it, it's a minor change that's very important. Uh, but on, awnings are forbidden uh, in, in modernist architecture. Because they, 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 they ruin the purity of the facade, OK? Whereas all over the world, you have an awning, you know, it comes down when the sun is full on the, on the, on the facade. Um, if you have something else that you're referring to, I'm not aware of it, so I can I cannot comment on on changing facades. Yes, yeah, so they are very rare now. They just like almost uh, only a theory, but some some examples exist. Um, and the last question from me. <laughs> so yeah, reading the Alexander. We are running out of the time because it was supposed to be one and a half hours. So I will ask <laughs> Professor if we can still uh, have that final oh, okay. question. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. I'm here. Yeah, reading okay. the Alexander patterns, it, it's it's a, a, lo a lot. The, there are a lot of patterns, and sometimes it seems that maybe they also contradict contradict each other. But on the other hand, they read almost like a rules and they are written in, in such a language that they tell you do this, do that. And it kind of seems like a computer language which could be used for programming. Um, do you think it's, it would be possible to make a program which uh, would interpret uh, Alexander's patterns in, in, and, and make a simulation of what would be happen if, if you use them. And maybe there were such a, attempts. 
Oh, yes, there, there have been s several very successful attempts. Just look at them online. There's a, um, a program by Bruno Postel, P-O-S-T-L-E, that uses the patterns, and he's, uh, he's uh, 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 selling results from his program. And uh, so uh, uh, the program it looks at the 1,000 configurations and then picks the three best ones. And, uh, you know, uh, some uh, work that would take a human team weeks or months to do, you know, and he does he does that and he, uh, he, he works as a consultant. So Bruno Postel, uh, he's, he's in the United Kingdom. Uh, to create, to um, clear up a misconception, the patterns are not rules, restrictive rules. The patterns are constraints, mathematical constraints. So designing with patterns tell you, you have an infinite number of configurations that must satisfy these constraints. OK, a rule tells you this is one configuration that's correct. That's not what the patterns tell you. Always the patterns, even if they have a number, say, you know, 20 meters, you have an infinite number of designs that will satisfy this constraint. So there are so many adjustments within the constraint. If you break the constraint, then you ruin the pattern and something negative. But you have so many uh, um, possible variations within the constraints. So, you know, you apply, you're not going to apply more than a dozen or 15 you know, or 20 patterns. So you work within those patterns and how many configurations fit within those patterns? Infinite number. Do you want any more than an infinite number? I don't think so. OK, as a mathematician, I think infinity is good enough. Now, what you just said, Marius, has been used by those who are threatened by the patterns to uh, disqualify them. They say, well, I don't want to be told what to do. Therefore, the pattern language has to be thrown out. This is the reaction of someone who wants to be able to create an inhuman building who doesn't want to satisfy the constraints, because the constraints make sure that the human user will have good health in such a building. That's the reaction. The reaction is one of ego. And for that precise reason, Marius, the pattern language is not taught in architecture schools. Because the architecture professors say, I don't want to be told what to do. I want to have unlimited freedom. OK, you have unlimited freedom to do what? To throw radioactive plutonium uh, in, on the ground. That's it's not uh, uh, allowed. OK, it's, it's bad for human health. Uh, I want to contradict you. Uh, it's taught Please, in our school. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you for your answers very much. <laughs> yes, thank you a lot. And as I said, uh, our uh, time is uh, going to the end. We are re really very, very grateful to hear from you. We also share the video record with our community and even wider. Thank you a lot for that possibility. And one more round of number. Well, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed talking. Now I need to get ready because I have to go to the university to give more courses. Thank you a lot. So bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.